Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 21st. Today, we celebrate one of my favorite botanists and his personal story of love and love of poetry and nature. We'll also learn about an extraordinary gardener who could grow anything, and I mean anything anything. We'll hear Rosemary Veery's thoughts on patterns. And we grow that garden library today with a behind the scenes look at the 2009 White House Garden and the modern community garden movement. And then we'll wrap things up with a celebration that may actually drive you nuts, but we're going to celebrate it nonetheless. Now, before we get to all of that, I wanted to take a quick second to ask you a favor. If you have time this week and can leave a review for the show over at Podchaser, I would very much appreciate that. Right now, the show has 10 reviews. I have a goal of getting 50 reviews for the show. So if you can help me reach my goal, I couldn't thank you enough. And I do want to take a quick second to thank the people who have already left a review for the show, Danny Perkins, Jeffrey, Claudia Helper, Michael Chava, Luke Ruggenberg, Mary Beth Hughes, Desiree, Sybil, and Kathy. And then the latest review was very kind. It was from Anastasia Abbott, and she wrote, In Jennifer's podcast, The Daily Gardener, she shares gardening tips, articles, books, plant information, shopping links, notable birthdays, and remembrances, and more daily. I always learn something, and I'm never disappointed gardening hats off, and a tip of the trowel for this wonderful, interesting podcast. Well, thank you for that, Anastasia. And hopefully, because of your review, more gardeners will find the show. And then next, I wanted to invite you to sign up for the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter, if you haven't already done so. This is a fun little email that you can get from me every Friday. And I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a little note from a friend. I share what's going on in my own garden world, along with new ideas and gardening inspiration that I save up all week to share with you. In addition, you'll get an extra dose of botanical history and literature to get you through the weekend. So just head on over to the website for the show at thedailygardener.com. O-R-G, thedailygardener.org, and sign up for the free Friday newsletter today. Here's today's curated news. Today's article is something that I found on the Better Homes and Gardens website, and it's a slideshow that has a number of excellent ideas for landscaping on a hillside. This is a common challenge for gardeners. And as you're looking at the slideshow, hopefully you'll find some inspiration. And in addition to that, I just want to encourage you to consider adding grasses. Grasses are excellent for hillsides. And of course, another wonderful option is to plant a mini forest there. So just two little extra ideas to consider. Now, if you'd like to see the little slideshow that I found on hillside landscaping ideas from Better Homes and Gardens, just search for the word hillside in the Facebook group for the show, and this slideshow will pop up. Now, if you're not a member of the free listener group of Daily Gardeners on Facebook, it's super easy to join. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Today, I'd like to welcome our newest members, Sandra Stewart, Hervé Merlin, Janet Hurlbrink, Lurie Allen, Marlene Newberry, and Bruna Siabari. Welcome, you guys. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the Washington, D.C.-based USDA botanist, 
Erwin Frank Smith, who was born on this day, January 21st in 1854. Irwin had attempted to solve the problem of peach yellows, which is a disease that's caused by a microorganism called a phytoplasma, and it was affecting peach orchards. This disease became known as the peach yellows because the main symptom shows up in new leaves that have a yellowish tint. Now, if Irwin had solved the problem of the peach yellows, he would have become world famous, but he didn't. It was actually the botanist Louis Kunkel who discovered that a type of leafhopper was actually carrying the disease. Now, Irwin might not have solved the peach yellows problem, but he was a peach of a guy. And I loved researching Irwin because as I was reading about him, I realized that I had discovered a rare combination of kindness and intellect. And Irwin was ahead of his time. He developed a reputation for hiring and promoting female botanists as his assistants at the Bureau of Plant Industry in D.C. And Irwin gave these women tasks based on their strengths instead of their job descriptions. And in many cases, these female botanists were able to work on projects that were way beyond the scope of their job description. The happiest day of Irwin's life was no doubt when he married the pretty Charlotte May Buffett on April 13th, 1893. Together, Irwin and Charlotte shared an epic love for each other and for reading and poetry. Tragically, after 12 years of marriage, Charlotte was diagnosed with endocarditis. She died eight months later on December 28th, 1906. Irwin dealt with his grief by putting together a book of poetry, stories, and a biography of Charlotte. The book is called For Her Friends and Mine, a book of aspirations, dreams, and memories. And I found a digital version of it online, so it's available for you to check out for free in today's show notes. In the beginning of this book, Irwin wrote, This book is a cycle of my life. Seven lonely years are in it. The long ode on page 62 is a cry of pain. Now, I loved reading this online memoir. But there was one passage in particular that Irwin wrote where he described Charlotte's fantastic ability to attune to the natural world. And I thought you would find it as touching as I did when I first read it. So I wanted to share it with you today. Charlotte's visual powers were remarkable. They far exceeded my own. Out of doors, her keen eyes were always prying into the habits of all sorts of living things. Had she cared for classification, which she did not, or had been willing to make careful records, she might have become an expert naturalist. Whether she looked into the tops of the tallest trees, or the bottom of a stream, or the grass at her feet— She was always finding marvels of adaptation to wonder at. She made a list of all the birds that visited her neighborhood, and she knew most of them by their songs. She distinguished individuals of the same species by little differences in their notes. She knew when they nested and where, how they made their nests, and what food they brought their young. In studying birds, she used an opera glass, not a shotgun. She was, however, a very good shot with the revolver. 
And today is the birthday of the incredible American gardener, plant whisperer, and horticulturist, Ray Selling Berry, who was born on this day, January 21st in 1881. Almost totally deaf by the time she was an adult, Ray was an excellent lip reader, and many suspect that her deafness helped her attune to plants. In the early 1900s, Ray started a new hobby, gardening. And like many gardeners, Ray began gardening with a few pots on her front porch. Well, it wasn't long before she was collecting and growing rare plants, not only on her home place, but also on two vacant lots she rented next door. After subscribing to many English garden magazines, Ray ordered her plants and seeds from the world's best nurseries. She also subscribed to exotic plant explorations so that she could get seeds from the top explorers like George Forrest, Frank Kingdon Ward, and Joseph Rock. Ray wanted the latest and greatest plants, and once she got them, she mastered growing them. In addition to rhododendrons, Ray had a weakness for primula. And during her lifetime, no one grew primulas better than Ray Berry Selling. And to illustrate just how much Ray loved primulas, in April of 1932, she wrote an article for the National Horticultural Magazine where she profiled the 61 species that she grew in her gardens. And the article was called Primulas in My Garden. By 1938, Ray and her husband bought a new property in Lake Oswego, Oregon. The location of the property along a great ridge offered a number of microclimates and growing conditions. Best of all, Ray's new place included water. There were springs and small rivers, as well as a marsh and a wetland. And each of these features offered unique advantages as Ray picked locations to site her incredible rare plants. Now, it's often said of Ray that she was in tune with the most finicky of plants. She had an uncanny ability to understand the needs of her various plant specimens, and she put those needs above the aesthetics of garden design. Her incredible rhododendron collection grew happily in simple raised frames behind her house. And in the spring, visitors to her garden were in awe of her beds, featuring great masses of rhododendrons in bloom. In the 1950s, Ray received a single corm of the Chilean blue crocus, Ticophylia cyanocrocus. Native to the Andes in Chile, this blue crocus is exceptionally rare to see in cultivation, unless you were Ray Berry. Apparently, there was one memorable spring when 75 Chilean blue crocus bloomed in her garden. Can you imagine? It was Ray Selling Berry who said, You don't tell a plant where to grow. It will tell you. In unearthed words, today's words are from one of my favorite gardeners, Rosemary Veery. She was a gardener and garden writer, and this is an excerpt from her chapter on January from her book, A Country Woman's Year. I enjoy patterns, man-made and natural, and as soon as I start looking around me, they are everywhere. The countryside in winter has tree skeletons silhouetted against the sky trees without leaves. One day, their background is dark gray. Another, it is clear blue. 
but there's always a natural pattern of trunk and branches, a lesson in symmetry with variations. As the snow slowly melts, man-made patterns still filled with snow scar the fields where the wheel marks of tractors crossed the newly sown corn last autumn, sometimes straight, sometimes following the line of walls or hedgerows. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, American Grown by Michelle Obama. This book came out in 2012, and the subtitle is The Story of the White House Kitchen Garden and Gardens Across America. In this book, we are reminded of the wonderful kitchen garden that Michelle Obama planted on the White House's South Lawn in April of 2009. This book takes us inside the White House kitchen garden from planning and planting to the final harvest. You'll learn about Michelle's worries and joys as a new gardener. Best of all, you'll get a behind the scenes look at the garden along with the recipes created by White House chefs. Finally, if you have an interest in putting together a school or community garden, there are plenty of tips for you. There are many inspiring stories of gardens from across the country, including the Houston office workers who made the sidewalk bloom, a New York City school that created a scented garden for the visually impaired, a North Carolina garden that devotes its entire harvest to those in need, and other stories of communities that are transforming the lives and health of their citizens. This book is 272 pages of gardening that stretches from the recent history of the White House to the great gardening going on in communities across America. You can get a copy of American Grown by Michelle Obama and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $3. That's a steal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is National Squirrel Appreciation Day, which was founded in 2001 by Christy Hargrove, a wildlife rehabilitator in Asheville, North Carolina. And Christy created this special day to acknowledge that food sources for squirrels are scarce in midwinter. Gardeners are generally of two minds when it comes to squirrels. They either don't mind them or they really dislike them. Thanks to their tremendous athleticism, squirrels are a challenging pest in the garden. For instance, it may seem impossible, but squirrels have a five-foot vertical and nowadays, their ability to leap is well documented on YouTube. Squirrels are also excellent sprinters and swimmers, and they are master zigzaggers when they run, a skill that comes in handy when they need to evade predators. A squirrel nest is called a dray. And squirrels make their nests with leaves, and the mother lines the inside of the dray with grass. Now, as squirrels bury acorns and other seeds, they either sometimes forget or simply don't return to some of their buried food. But lucky for squirrels, they can smell an acorn buried in the ground beneath a foot of snow. Now, as gardeners, we need to remember that squirrels perform an essential job for trees. They help the forest renew itself by caching seeds and burying them. In fact, the job that squirrels do in caching seeds is absolutely critical to the survival of some trees. So, on this winter day... I bid you happy National Squirrel Appreciation Day. 
Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. Today is National Squirrel Appreciation Day. I can't even say it.